it's not living. I don't call it living. You know, me, I just call it you just existing. I ain't had no hug in 12 years, man. I ain't had a kiss in 12 years. The Huntsville unit in Texas. Nearly every week, a prisoner is executed here. This is the actual uh, death house here. The prisoners brought here about six hours prior to the execution, and we're five, six hours. It's in this cell that the prisoner will receive his last meal. Most all of them take a shower, get cleaned up. They can choose the clothes to wear at the execution. Some will prefer to be in uh, their prison whites that, they, that they've worn all the time. Others will choose to be uh, executed in what is called free world clothes. This is the actual death chamber. It has a number of straps, the straps for the arms, the straps for the ankles. Uh, it has a chest strap. This room is the, um, is the, is the room where the witnesses will witness the execution. The purpose of the microphone is, is that it will amplify his voice into, the, into this next room, and the room over here is where the witnesses will be witnessing the execution. Before that time comes, the prisoners often wait for years on the so-called death row. In this brand new complex in Livington, around 450 prisoners await the execution, including Oswaldo Soriano, who has been waiting 10 years. This is just waiting for you to, for your number to come up. You know how them lotteries come up in little round balls and they pop up? That's what you are, you're just a number. You have a number, and that's it. Society feels that, Attention all officers our that we're animals. Prepare for count, prepare for count. They, feel, they feel that we're animals. They feel that we don't deserve nothing but the execution. And here in Louisiana sits Lawrence Jacobs, Jr. He's been in for eight years and was barely 17 when he was sentenced to death and arrived on death row. Hi, how are you doing? You're Lawrence? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Robert. Robert. Hi, Robert. Nice to meet you. I'm Robert. I was depressed. You know, I just wanted to sleep. I just didn't want to talk to nobody at first. And, you know, word just got out that I was young when I got out there, so... You know, they had some people that had been up there a, lot, a long time. They're just some older people, and they came talk to me. You know, like, it's just like, you in the fight for your life, man. You just can't lay down. You know, you, you got to fight not just for you, for your family. You know, because it's, it, it's, it's not a game. You know, they, they, they're killing people, you know. <laughs> Two American boys, their life hanging by a thread. One fighting for his life in the court of Louisiana and the other in a death cell in Texas. Both were not yet 18 years old when the crime took place. One, Lawrence, can't tell us much about what happened because it can harm his case. The other, as Waldo, wants to tell his side of the story which becomes clear from a letter he wrote on an internet website for death row prisoners. We can talk to him on death row in the visitor's area, which officially can't be filmed. Oswaldo is in a queue behind thick glass. A guard gives a transmitter microphone to him. The interview itself happens through the phone. Open-heartedly, he tells us how he came to committing a murder. Into a city and went clubbing, hanged around with some friends, and met some other people at the clubs. 
Or, you know, being around girls, you want to have fun, you want to have a little bit of money, you're doing drugs, you know, that nature. You like the style, they bring excitement, you know, desires in one, stuff like that as a kid, teenager. And, well, these women said they wanted some money if we were going to still continue being with them and have fun and party. Well, we went to, actually, we went to this store, me and this small partner of mine, and I didn't know he had a gun. And when we got inside the store, he tells me, here, get this gun. I said, what do you want me to do with the gun? He said, I want you to point it at that clerk, you know? And the clerk sits right there where you at, I'm right here. So when I get to the counter, I point the gun at the clerk like this. And this far part of mine is arguing with the clerk. They're arguing, they're arguing. And by the time you know it, I'm looking out the window, make sure nobody comes in. I don't want to hurt this man. I mean, I never hold a gun, but I'm not going to hurt him. I know better than that. Well, when this, somehow this, he went around, he was going to go around the counter. When he went around the counter, I looked, when I looked, this clerk felt that that was the time to snatch the gun off me. When he snatched the gun like that, I looked back and, and I pulled and I shot him, I shot him. I dropped the gun, my father partner took off running. He left me there by myself. I dropped the gun, I went around the counter and see if he was all right. But I seen too much blood, man. I seen too much blood and I knew, that was, I knew there was no way to call the police, call some help. You know, I picked up the gun and burned off. Lawrence was also convicted for armed robbery. At the end of 1996, in Marrero, a suburb of New Orleans, a group of young black men break into the house of Nelson Bow, age 45, and his mother Della, age 73. The boys force the inhabitants to give away valuable possessions. The tension builds and ends in the murder of Nelson and Della. Lawrence is caught. In the court, it becomes clear that the die is cast. One of the prosecutors is wearing a necktie with the Grim Reaper on it, and the other a picture of a gallow. The jury agrees and finds only one sentence suiting, death. It's just like, like the whole world just stopped, you know. Like I couldn't hear nothing, just like my heart just pounding, you know, just not just just couldn't believe it, you know. Yeah. Lawrence is barely 17, and at that time, the youngest prisoner on death row. This is Crime Watch. Crime Watch. Good morning, and welcome to Crime Watch for Saturday, October 23rd, 2004. I'm Crime Watch is a weekly radio broadcast about crime in New Orleans. Today's theme is juvenile crime. Guests are two candidate juvenile judges. Kids are committing violent crimes at a much early age. I want to start with you, Miss King, and then I'll get to you, Miss Jenkins. Uh, how will you treat violent offenders, and what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on the death penalty for juveniles? Well, I think you need to be locked up. If you commit murder, armed robbery, rape, arson, you need to go to jail. Uh, aggravated uh, battery, because you took a weapon and you harmed someone. Um, basically, I don't have an opinion as to the death penalty, and um, because I think that's an um, issue uh, that will come before uh, the court as a juvenile judge. So I don't have any opinion as to that. I respect the law of this state in our Constitution, so if the law says that we have death penalty, then we do. The only problem with the death penalty is that you have a disparate impact upon poor people mm -hmm. first. I'm not going to even say race first. It's poor people, and then you look at the race. And then the death sentence for youths are so politically sensitive, the candidate juvenile judges don't dare to make clear statements. And well, and 
And until next week, I'm John Marie. I'm off to Baton Rouge. I'll see you guys later. Y'all have a good week. This is Crime Watch. The radio show is an initiative of the organization Victims and Citizens Against Crime, who stands up for the rights of victims. My sister-in-law was Pamela Kinnamore. It, it, it received worldwide attention and news. She was one of the victims that was murdered by the Baton Rouge serial killer back in July 12th of 2002. Board member Ed White says members of his organization strongly believe in the usage of the death sentence. I think going back though, if, if you look at our, at our nation's history, uh, our nation was originally founded through many of the principles that we find in God's Word and in the Holy Bible. And this is where the death penalty itself comes from, in my judgment. And uh, by the way, uh, I, I've given you a copy. There are several scripture references, Leviticus 24, 17, where the scriptures are really clear. It says, whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. And if someone is willing to commit first degree murder, uh, then, and especially if someone's 16 or 17, if they're old enough to create that violent crime, then in the judgment of our judicial system and criminal justice system, they're also old enough to suffer the consequences of that, which, which in our society is death. My daughter, Kathy, was 26 at the time that she was uh, sexually assaulted and murdered by two 15-year-old boys. In Texas, we talked with Linda White of a different organization, Murder Victims, Families for Reconciliation. Her daughter left behind a child. The five-year-old Amy was raised and eventually adopted by her grandmother, Linda White. Both disagree with the death penalty. It's a visceral response to a horrid, horrid thing that's done to you, and there's nothing that's going to be good enough. Nothing will ever feel right enough. And so I understand why people go that way, and I leaned that way for a little while. But I began to be very uncomfortable with it. It felt to me like uh, violence for violence simply perpetuates violence. And it's become very apparent to me in the last uh, probably six, eight years because I've met so many family members who've had loved ones executed or who were living with their loved ones, being on death row, knowing that that could come any month, any year, any moment. And I have found that you know, knowing what it feels like to lose your child to a homicide, I just can't advocate doing that to another woman, another mother, another father. The town Huntsville in Texas lives on the prison industry. Many of the inhabitants make a living in one of the five prison units in the area. They're used to the prisoners in their white suits. They're not surprised by the demonstrators at the walls anymore, the oldest prison in the centre of the city. Today, another execution is planned. This time, it's Dominique Green's turn. He was just 18 when committing the crime, so there's no chance of a stay of execution for him. I don't kill cockroaches for that matter. I don't kill nothing uh, I can't eat. Simple as that. We need to make ourselves visible. Uh, politicians and the government needs to know that there is a constituency and there are people who are opposed to the death penalty. And we need to keep sending that message. There's a Puerto Rican leader, a uh, revolutionary named Don Pedro Albizu Campos, who said when tyranny is law, revolution is order. And that's why we feel that's, not, that's unlawful. There's all, all types of laws that are not just because they benefit, uh, they benefit the rich, mostly and they benefit other people, and they really don't benefit the whole country, you know? Outside the prison are two sons of the murdered victim. Oddly enough, they also think Green shouldn't be executed. Son Andre even visited Dominique Green the day before. Their first meeting, and probably their last. I had years to get over it, you know, because 
I thought about it for a while. I used to feel a lot of hurt and anger, mad that he was gone, you know. But, you know, I've been coming closer to Christ. The older I get, the wiser I get. He's a real person. I met him yesterday, and I seen that he really is a righteous person. So he don't deserve to go down like this. Nobody really does. I would like to look forward to seeing him again and being able to meet him. The road in front of the prison is closed. There's a bizarre ambience. Dominique Green is to be executed at six o'clock. But, but at the last moment, his lawyer requests an appeal at the Supreme Court. Outside, hope grows for a stay of execution. You strengthen us in the struggle for justice. Help us to work tirelessly for the abolition of state-sanctioned death and to renew our society in its very part. Amen. Six hours pass, darkness settles, and all eyes are aimed at the road in front of the prison at all times. On the other side, in the administrative office, the witnesses of the execution wait for the result of the request. 1947, the witnesses cross over. That can mean only one thing. Dominique Green will be executed. I don't know what kind of words, you know, but I just feel bad about it, you know, because he, the person I met was a good person. He didn't deserve to die. I was, look, I was, I pray that I look forward to seeing him again, but, you know, maybe one day I get to meet him again when, it, when God come to judge me, you know, but, um. Dominique Green was buried in private. Many prisoners who went before him are never claimed by their family. For them, there's a special cemetery outside of Huntsville. Back to Oswaldo, who was a close friend of Dominique Green and knows the same fate awaits him. Yeah, I knew him, you know, we grew up here together. We grew up here together as kids. We develop as grown men, you know, and it affected me last night real bad, you know. As you've seen, it affects me now, you know, because I know someday I have to go that path. The Supreme Court doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do nothing. I will have to go that path. And what his parents experience, sisters, his loved ones, I know someday my parents have to experience. And that's experience I don't want to go through. Well, it's hard for me because me and my family, we're a real close family. You know, we do everything together. And, um, you know, it, it's hard for me, you know, just being on death row because, you know, it's just, it just, it just hard, just like, like, like your family just taken away from you, you know, all at once, you know. Just, I could just, I just sit and dream about, you know, how I used to just wake up early in the morning, and, you, know, you know, just hearing, hearing the birds chirp in my window, you know, just my little brother busting through the door, you know, trying to give me a hug, jump on the bed while I'm still in the bed, you know. Just the bonding with me and my father, you know. You know, just my mother's smile, just, just seeing her smile, you know. You know, missing my grandma, kissing me on my cheek, you know. You know, my auntie, her laughter, you know, just all those things together, it just, it, 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 it real takes a toll, you know, it takes a toll, you know, I just, I try to be strong for them because, you know, they trying to be strong for me. I grew up, I grew up knowing that I had to die for, for a crime, but and I'm not, that's not going to stop me. You're not going to stop me with that, you know, we all got to die, sure. And I know that someday they might stick a needle in me and would put what they have to put inside my veins. But I know that uh, I didn't continue in them ways of life. I changed for the better. I tried. I, I forced myself, you know? That's what I have, that's, that's what I look for. 
I believe that if a person gets to that point where they, they are not only involved in, in, in other felonies, because that's what they have to be to be convicted of first degree murder, but now they're taking the lives of innocent people on purpose. You know, that's an important point. It's not an accident. It's not manslaughter. It's not vehicular homicide. This is the willful, deliberate act of taking another human being's life. When a person gets to that point, then yes, I believe the odds are extremely high that he is not going to be able to be rehabilitated. If you had the opportunity to, uh, to speak to the, the victims, victim's family, what would you tell them? I'd tell them that, I feel that I would tell them that I'm deeply sorry. That it wasn't me that killed the loved one. That it was the drugs, the kid that lived on the streets, person with no morals, no values in life, no consideration, a lot of hatred. I tell man that I was sorry, that, that I regret taking a loved one from them, that no matter what, that I could not replace him. He gave me a gift in return. He made me live. I'm, I'm still alive, you know. And that's true, you know. I mean, that's all I can tell him, you know. But it's life, you know. Excuse me. US Supreme Court can bring a change for Oswaldo and Lawrence. They can decide that young men below the age of 18 can't be sentenced to death. New cerebral research shows that control over impulsive behaviour and judgement is too lacking in youths, so they shouldn't be sentenced as adults. That age group uh, of young person is far too um, impulsive. They don't have the same control, not that all of us, you know, are able to attain that kind of control, but they certainly haven't had the chance to develop that. I'm not saying they don't know right from wrong, but depending upon where you grow up and how you grow up, that may be impacted as well. Scientists and academicians tell us that after about six or seven years old, a person has the age, you know, comes to the age of reason. They, they can, within reason, know right from wrong. By the time a person's 16 or 17, in my judgment, they know right from wrong. They really do. Now again, there may be some circumstances in their background and so on that may have caused this violent behavior. I'm not denying that. But the point still remains that, in my judgment, a person, by the time they hit 16, 17, they, they know what they're doing. I did 12 years already. I'm not asking you to let me go today, tomorrow, three years from now, you know? I'm just asking you that you give me a chance to rehabilitate further down the road where someday when I'm 30, 35, 40 years old, I have that opportunity to step out. Attention all officers, all stations. It is now count time. It is now count time. That I can step out and be an access to somebody in society, a kid. Why kill me now? Why well, I know I can help somebody right now in the world? There's many kids out there doing the same thing. Why kill me? Why kill somebody else? Why don't you help them? Let them teach them. Let them be a, a, a role model for them. You know? Every day, every day you wake up, I mean, to me, it's like you just looking death in the eye. Every time you see somebody pass your cell on death row, just the look of, you know, just a sad look, you know, and you just, you can't really push it away. It, you just try to maintain, you know, just try to be strong, you know, just pray that the outcome isn't death. Okay, 
Give me uh, what can I do? You have to be strong for yourself. Like, on for yourself, on your own. For yourself, for your parents, okay. for your loved ones. Okay, I want to thank you. I need my mic already. Yeah, I want to thank you very much. Right, hold on. Okay. Yeah.